let's uh, get started. Let's talk about layouts first. So with this release, CADMATE is able to store basically arbitrary sets of window layouts without their contents, though, yet. This will follow at some point. But currently, you can, as you probably have seen, oh, uh, use the little layouts menu up here. And uh, if you click on an item, if there is anything already in there, it's going to ask you whether it can destroy your workspace and come up with whatever has been saved instead. Um, to add new layouts of this sort, like if you have a regular tracing workflow set up, that might be useful. You can also uh, close everything in here. And to store a new uh, layout, something like that, you just obviously press on save there and give it a name. And uh, it's going to be there, right? And you can now easily toggle between layouts. It will store subscriptions. So the 3D viewer is still subscribed to its selection table and, uh, or any other subscription that has been there. So these setups uh, are preserved. Um, next point in here is that you can uh, configure or manually edit them. This is a rel relatively crude still, since this is just a text box. But if you go into the settings widget, you see this uh, uh, text box here with a lots, of, lots of gibberish in there. But uh, if you, that's currently the only way to delete a layout. Of course, there needs to be some extra UI to make this just a single click. But uh, just so you know, to briefly explain what's going on there, there's one layout per line. And if we were to delete uh, the last layout we added, uh, it's going to be that part, starting with layout. And it's basically like a function call. But uh, next update will have a proper UI to also get rid of them again. But currently, you can delete that. and. Uh, exiting the text box will store it, and now the layout is gone, right? So, um, and they follow this layout specification, follows essentially what's also up here. Uh, in one of the last releases, we introduced these default layouts that basically gives a really short and concise implementation of uh, a representation of a layout. So you could write them manually, but I guess in most cases there, uh, no one really bothers to do that, and you would just click on the Save button there. Thanks. Um, and an addition to this already existing functionality of layouts is that now tab tabbed windows can also be stored. Alas, not in the production setup right now. If we do that, uh, you get an error like this. Oh, well, not like that, but yes. Yeah, so you get this error. Uh, this has been fixed since, and next update will fix that, uh, which I'm probably going to do tonight. OK. Uh, any questions regarding the layouts? But they basically do what they are supposed to do. And at some point, we might store also actual neurons in there, or links to that, or patterns, annotations like that, that would come up with a similar list again. Um, OK. Uh, next widget that got quite a few changes is the landmark widget. Um, so far. Let me close everything. Yes, I can do that. Okay. So so far, landmarks have been relatively hard to create and to deal with, especially given that in the adult data set there aren't any landmarks yet. Um, are created based uh, on like NERF court entry points, like it's been done uh, by Michael Winding and others uh, in the L1. And so what you can do now to create new landmarks uh, is one, there is this ed Edit Landmarks tab in here, which uh, should provide a little bit easier interface to create landmarks. So you don't have to deal with these large tables here. But what you basically would do is if you go and create a new landmark, let me just go somewhere where there's no uh, real data yet. So. You could just start typing, uh, say, my new group. Uh, since you know landmarks are organized in groups, and if we use them, for instance, to make transformations between those landmark sets, we basically deal with groups all the time. So we got to give it a new name and uh, edit. And now you could just uh, go ahead and add landmarks uh, from 
uh, whatever location where you add to that group. So if I want to add this location, say as landmark one, uh, I could say the center of view is one landmark, and maybe my next landmark is the active node here, and so on and so on. And this makes it much easier to quickly go through a bunch of nodes that you know have maybe a mapping to another pair of nodes or another set of nodes uh, in another location in the brain. So obviously, you typically do one landmark group at a time. And like I said, we use you, uh, to make them actually useful, you would need other landmark groups, so you would still need to create others that would use the same landmarks so that there could be a mapping between them. Also, speaking um, of mappings, oh, let me uh, get back to that later. Another way of creating landmarks, uh, since this is what we were just talking about, is to use volumes. And what you can do now is, for instance, use uh, uh, only the bounding boxes of volumes, though. So this is a very simple approach, but still might get you, if you're looking for neurons where you have one side, into the right ballpark area where you might look. Uh, obviously, this will be refined in the future to make this uh, a little bit more useful. But if we, for instance, select these two uh, volumes here, we could now create new landmarks based on that. And to do that, some space. Um, to do that, we could now say, okay, uh, volume A, and you create them in pairs, um, since it expects you to use this as a mapping between those volumes. And select the second one. We could define a mirror axis, because if we don't do that, and you look at the individual bounding box corner points, uh, by default, it will just apply the same landmark names to the same corner of the other bounding box. And this allows us to mirror them so that we can have a mirror relationship between the points as well, right? And if we look at those uh, volumes again, we see that we actually, so we want to mirror them like that, right? So this is the x-axis is on the horizontal line here, or axis. So we're gonna, gonna use the x-axis mirror as well. And also, new census release landmark groups can be put into relation to each other. You can, for instance, uh, scroll down. Uh, oh, maybe not. Let's quickly get more space. OK. So uh, what you can do now, you can put individual landmarks, landmark groups and relations to each other. This is useful if you have larger sets of groups. You can define not, now not only target groups anymore, but also target relations. I show this in a second. So you can uh, quickly create transformation, not based uh, transformations based on a single source group that would kind of propagate, propagate to other groups uh, based on this relation. I'll show what I mean in a second. So, but uh, based on this selection, we could now create a new pair of landmarks. And if we, well, I guess it doesn't refresh yet, so let's um, open the 3D viewer again. And this now created uh, those two landmark groups here. Let's show the volumes together with them. So um, like I said, these are just the simple bounding boxes, right? And if we Yes, that's too small. Quickly see if we can see the labels. Oh, that's way too small. Okay. Well, the individual vertices in here have a label for the corresponding landmark name too, but I just realized it's uh, they're a little bit too small. Anyway, um, so we create the, those two landmarks here, and I'm stuck scrolling. All right. So um, so let's maybe find to show you what this now can do. Um, some neurons that would actually be somewhere in them. And I guess one easy way to do that is to just move the layer there. So just, just picking random neuron here. And as you can see, it's like not even in the box, the bounding box that we, let me get rid of that. 
uh, it's only partially in the bounding box, but let's uh, stick with this example nonetheless. So if we now wanted to create an image of this neuron into the, uh, in this group, in the second group, we can use a landmark widget to say, uh, create a new display, a transformation based on, well, the active skeleton, and we created this new group, and our target group for now is this. And in the 3D viewer, you see now this one, oh, the second one. We could use a different color there to make this better distinguishable, but you get the idea that you can like transform what we did now, created the transformation, a virtual skeleton based on this one, based on the transformation between those two bounding boxes, right? And uh, you can imagine if you have many of those boxes, if you have like a segmented pattern, like in the C and, and the VNC, uh, for instance, um, you would, might have many of these patterns of these, uh, of these groups, so you could quickly transform, create many of those transformations if you're looking for those neurons, for instance, to trace them out, actually. Um, by, oops, we're out of landmarks. By not using a target uh, group, but a target trans, uh, uh, link or between groups, that's what I mentioned earlier, we could now, instead of picking a target group here, we could also say, well, we start here, uh, from this group and all the neurons that are, uh, say, adjacent. Uh, that's the transformation we used before uh, to link those other two groups that we create, created based on the volume. So if we add this, or did this actually something? Uh, oh. Oh, maybe it didn't do that. Let's quickly try that again. Okay, so, but that's the idea. You select still a source group, oh, you'll select a target relation. Um, but maybe I didn't specify it. Let's see. Oh, okay, well, there was actually no relation that I added, it seems. So let's maybe quickly one, add one. Oh. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, I thought I added one already before. Um, and now the same thing applies. Uh, And the same thing happens as before, right? So um, I think that was I was wanted to say about the landmarks widget. Um, the layering on the stack viewer, right? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Also, uh, what's now possible is that you actually have a landmark layer because it typically that's uh, the tracing view is typically a way you want to see those transformations when you actually want to trace them out, right? So. Um, by default, if you have the landmark widget open now, it creates a landmark layer. There is this little toggle up here. And if you look into the, well, let me make a little bit more space first. Um, so if you look into the layer settings here, there is no landmark layer. Oh, ah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so there it is, there's a landmark layer. And uh, now we, let's maybe make this a little big. Bigger. Uh, you can shift click on the 3D. Of yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm just uh, there are too many windows already. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, right. So I just clicked on a random location in the transform skeleton, and it brings you to this location here. And if we, we can now follow along and see, oh, okay, that's where the transformation thinks the skeleton should be, right? It's this yellow big dot here, and we could change this to make this, uh, uh, oh, okay. There's only a tiny edge that actually, actually gets recolored. The node itself does not. Let me quickly take a note on that. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so that's basically now possible as well. And uh, like Albert suggested, a good way to find this location is actually using the 3D viewer to jump to that location. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to locate the place. Right. Um, let's see, what else have we got for landmarks? Um, we talked about the relations um, and the layer. And right, one just minor detail. What's different? Be a different behavior from before is that before you always had to explicitly mark the 3D viewer as a target for the created transformations. This isn't the case anymore. It's the selected by default because that's what you typically want. And uh, also, uh, the state is saved of the settings of the widgets by default now. And just as a uh, reminder, because I was talking to someone uh, this morning about this, uh, in case it's not clear. If you, by default, these two settings here take care of loading and saving the state automatically for individual widget. I guess most of you know this, but just as a reminder. And uh, I like it better to not save the default as a la uh, the last state of a widget as a default, so I switch that off. And in general, you can save a current state if you say this is your de the default you want by clicking on this little window icon up here and brings up that panel and it has the Save Settings button here. And you can also reset all that in case uh, you're uh, unsatisfied with the default you set before. OK. Um, let's see. OK. Any questions regarding the landmarks, landmark widget transformations? OK. Let's continue with the 3D viewer. Uh, a nice addition uh, amended by Andrew is, the, uh, is that the 3D viewer now can show for orthogonal views a scale bar. So if we go and select orthographic mode, you see down here there's a scale bar now. And in orthographic mode, all the dimensions are comparable since there's no perspective transform, right? Uh, uh, this is actually quite useful to get an idea about the scale within your th 3D space. You can toggle that on and off somewhere. Oh, and uh, we need to redraw it also. OK, so but that's possible in principle to do that. Um, but let's go back to uh, perspective mode. OK, also only a minor thing. If you store now images, you get actually asked for a name. It's not using the default name. Because if you generate a lot of images, that gets uh, chaotic quickly. Um, so. I guess it's clear what it does, but if you click here, you can give it a different name now, and it will use that. Same is true for SVG, obviously. Um, also, uh, as part of a small change with respect to state saving in the, in the 3D viewer is that volumes and their color configuration are now stored as part of the state. So if you have some default volumes that you want to show every time you open a 3D viewer, you could just go and uh, say we want to have those uh, selected all the time. So let's save this as into my default state and open a new, opening a new 3D viewer will bring them up now by default. Didn't change the coloring, but that would be part of the state as well. Um, so that uh, makes it also easier after an update, for instance, to kind of get back to your working state. Um, while it wasn't really visible in this uh, volume because, because I didn't really adjust for the text scaling. Um, oh, well, I guess I can actually adjust for the text scaling. Um, is that landmarks uh, are now shown with the actual landmark ID. So if you create, or landmark name, if you create landmarks, might be, and have many landmarks, sometimes hard to see. So let's maybe load them back and find, oh, here's the text scaling. Let's make that a little bit bigger, let's see if that's enough. Okay, it needs to be even bigger. Okay, but you see already, like, there's, there are names popping up. Let's go even bigger. On all the individual corners here of these landmark group visualizations, you see now the name of the actual group, uh, making it a little bit easier to create those groups and compare the individual landmarks to each other because the idea is still that they have to map, right? And so mirroring and all that needs to be. Uh, accounted for, and this is a way to debug this as a developer, but also to uh, use this, I guess, to confirm that you create the right uh, landmarks, landmark groups. Okay, like you've, 
seen, we kind of just text scaling. Now this is also the, uh, applies also to things like the neural name, uh, which is shown if you click the, oh, interesting, well, <laughs> which should be shown. Oh, that's a typo, can't spot that. Just a second. Uh, all right. Okay. Also, uh, as a result of a, a good catch by Albert, uh, videos or animations are now, are now also only exported with uh, even numbers. Because before, I don't know if you ever ran into that or if you export animations anywhere uh, in the first place, uh, if you didn't use even numbers for your frame, the exported video, some tools that we suggest in our documentation like FFmpeg uh, uh, come up with uh, pretty weird error messages that uh, because they, the codec that we also suggest in our documentation to deal with the exported videos can't deal with odd uh, height or width of the frames. So that's why the CADMATE exporter enforces this. Okay. A um, few changes in the graph widget. Um, let's quickly open that. Um, first thing you note is that uh, the nodes and edges uh, replace or this the nodes and edges tab replace the graph tab from before so uh, and obviously the related settings or respective settings are in the respective tabs um, to uh, make the UI a little bit easier and the individual aspects easier to configure of nodes and edges and one thing that you can now configure um, is that you uh, let's see uh, well, not directly to the edges, but you can say errors should have the same color as the uh, origin node. So let's maybe add uh, Okay, maybe that was strict. But there are just no synapses. Okay, I just want to add some edges on here. Okay. So one thing you can do now is up and seem to find the settings. Just a second. Let's go to the notes tab. Okay. Then change the color of the. Oh, here it is. Okay. The and there you could. Hmm? That's for the color of the nodes. Oh, source. Okay. So I guess it should be that, right? Um, if you change to source, it should have changed to orange. It didn't. Let's maybe add this node as a. Source means the node from which the arrow comes. Oh, okay, you don't mean the skeleton source. No. Okay. So, but how do we activate that? It should happen already. Just we set it to source, right, didn't we? No, it's yeah, it's the source, okay. Go try source, and then go to edges. Edges? Oh, ah. Then that one. Ah, okay. There we go, okay. <laughs> um, right, so you can now color errors accordingly. Uh, and there are, I guess, in well, this case, there are no different colors here, but uh, you could, of course, to color them depending on various uh, things, right? So this allows for prettier graphs. And also really nice is that we can now change the type of error that is used, the arrow marker, the head, and uh, by things like that. You see this menu here and there are all sorts of uh, nice uh, arrowheads that are now available in here, thanks to Albert. And um, then there is a selections tab. 
where you can kind of create a selection on the fly that you want to treat to together to, to toggle visibility, uh, for instance, so we could a, a test selection, and we could now use this here to uh, unselect it, deselect it, remove it, or select them uh, all, or uh, do things like that. So it's easier to treat nodes as a group without actually creating a graph group uh, uh, as a set that you want to handle as a one thing. Okay, and also, uh, as requested last time, uh, there's basic state saving now, so all the regular color properties and the arrowheads you select, all that is now part of the state, and you can set this either automatically if you close the widget or just by sa uh, saving the state there. Okay, then um, questions regarding the graph widget? All right, so uh, small change in the reconstruction sampler. Um, that some of you use is that the preview or the generally the visualization of intervals only now uses two colors by default. Before we had this colorful mess <laughs> and it's kind of hard to see uh, individual domains. So if you would now create a sampler, we only use two colors and that makes it a little bit easier to discern whether that makes sense or not. And I think, you, yeah, you can still go back to the, the old behavior if you want, uh, but I think that's more practical. Also, one bug fix relating the reconstruction sample, although it's not mentioned here, it's mentioned the bug fix section is that so far, um, if you deleted a node, so in general, if a sampler is used on a, widget, uh, on a, on a neuron, merges and splits are still uh, prevented, so that can't happen. But if you, as part of, say, extending an individual new uh, interval by tracing it out to completion or finding synapses in there, and you would delete a node that is part of either an interval start or end, the interval uh, would be gone, or until now, until this release, uh, the, internal was in, uh, the interval was deleted as well, which is, of course, a bug and shouldn't happen. And so if you have seen before intervals vanishing for some spurious reason, that's probably why, because a node was deleted that was part of the interval definition. And so there was this cascading delete effect. This is now prevented, and you can't delete nodes anymore that are either part of the domain start and end nodes or respect of the intervals start and end nodes as well. As well. Um, okay, then maybe not so important for regular manual tracing, but it seemed to be useful to deal with already seg uh, segmented and skeletonized data, is that there are now fast split and fast merge modes available. What this means is that these are modes where there is no confirmation di dialogue, where you have to confirm whether a certain set of annotations or the merge or split in general is what you actually want. This will just do it. And so in general, oh, that's uh, potentially dangerous, of course, and, uh, but uh, if you know what you're doing and if you deal with a lot of skeletons that are like a lot of fragments that come out of automated skeletonization and segmentation, then uh, this might actually be very useful since you can maybe get a feeling on how these uh, skeleton fragments are. And to activate that, you would need to go uh, down to the end of the settings widget and there is a fast split and merge mode. And so if, and these have similar settings or basically the same settings as the visibility groups. So if you are not familiar with those, up here there is a set of settings called visibility groups where you can define sets of neurons that you want to show or hide automatically and associate that with keys to toggle this behavior. And a similar set of settings to select the neurons where this fast merge and fast split mode should be applied can be set down here either by saying, well, I want to this apply to all skeletons, I want a certain annotation or meta annotation actually to respect, uh, represent the set of neurons where I want to be, want, that I want to fast merge. Because another aspect of that is that um, the, if you merge a skeleton, obviously there is a losing, it's a losing skeleton, right, that is not there anymore in terms of its identity afterwards. And neurons that are matched with this pattern here are always on the losing side. So if you merge skeletons with this fast split or fast merge mode, uh, well, that applies to fast merge mode, then uh, 
the skeleton in this other group will be uh, losing, and the one that you are starting out with is always the winning one. But that's, I guess, typically the case anyway when you're tracing, you're from the perspective of that, you look from the perspective of that neuron, right? So you could now say, um, say, uh, I don't know. Oh, let's see what's under there. Okay. So just to quickly show you what happens, there is. Um, so let's say we. Let's, let's call this Tom and give it a meta annotation Tom meta. And now we could say that. We want oops. so now we set that, and if we were to merge in here, we still get the dialog. Let's see. Let's try that. Maybe it didn't. Maybe because I just created the annotation. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so apparently because I just created the, uh, the annotation, it didn't really uh, recognize it before. So, but yeah, that's how it goes, right? And the same is obviously true if I would now select the fast split mode. See also meta and splitting the thing. Oh, well, just a second. Okay, well. Hmm? You have to actually choose it from the select drop down because it's not actually based on the string match. Uh. The only annotation I need is associated with what's in the auto complete. I thought I'd change that. You did not retain the annotation from the merge? Uh, well, it's still got the annotation and it still has got the meta annotation. One more try, and let's force this. The annotation it has is just Tom, not Tom Meta. Oh, uh, yeah, but it's a meta annotation. Yeah, so the as long as the annotation Tom still is annotated with Tom Meta, it should work. Okay, but there's apparently something off. I'm gonna check on that later. Just quickly write this down. All right. Guess one last thing I want to try with respect to that is just set it to all annotations, uh, all skeletons to figure out whether this has to do with the annotations. Okay, so apparently it's something to do with the annotations, but that's what it does. And let's reset that so I don't accidentally merge and split things without confirmation. Okay, then um, another small change, also motivated mainly uh, by dealing with many little fragments in the sample E. Uh, skeleton, skeletonization segmentation data set is that if you use P, which you can be used uh, short for peaking, kind of for a particular skeleton, if you hover over a skeleton and press P, it will light up in all the 3D viewers. Maybe let's go somewhere else where there are interesting skeletons. Okay, so if I oh, don't press G, but P. Okay, there it is. Don't know why it doesn't show that one. Okay, but you can now hover, hover over it with the mouse instead of clicking on it and selecting it, which was the case before. This is still possible to show the active neuron by 
selecting and pressing, I think. Let's see. Control P or Shift P. Oh, and we now got a filter here. Um, shift, okay. So Shift P should now, yeah, regardless of where my mouse is, will still show the selected one, right? And whatever that is. But otherwise, hovering over another skeleton and pressing P will just show it. Um, also, only minor detail. detail, if you just want to browse the tracing data set and pan freely around, you have this little button up here now. If you choose that, you can just use your left mouse button to scroll around like with regular, uh, like with the navigator tool here, um, but still have the tracing data, uh, tracing layer on. This makes it sometimes easier and you can't interact with the individual skeletons except for keyboard shortcuts. You still can select with G and things like that, but it's otherwise kind of safer to browse around, especially in a laptop. Um, where accidental clicks might happen quicker. Um, what else? Also, another small detail uh, is that you can now select all the all neurons when you're splitting, uh, all the annotations when splitting uh, skeletons. So if we say, oh, let's check that I don't accidentally at all. Okay. Oh. That wasn't intended. Okay, but let's still stick to our demo skeletons here. So splitting now uh, has this little, they, there are these little checkboxes here which allow you to toggle all the annotations, especially for large sets of annotations. This might help. One thing that would probably work as well is, let's see, maybe it doesn't, okay. We're thinking there's also this feature that you can use when you have many checkboxes to use Control X to select the, the bounding box, but apparently it doesn't work in the 3D and in this dialogue. Anyway, okay, then almost through. Um, some minor changes to the statistics widget. Uh, here is that you can also now have the time unit of all to not have individual columns at all anymore, so you can see Basically, what have you done in the whole time you have been tracing? Like, uh, if you're interested in the cable length you produce, that's now like visible in one view. And also, you can uh, select groups easily. You can, huh. well, maybe not easily, but you can select individuals and uh, get an uh, accumulated uh, count stats for that. Um, oh yeah. Uh, there's another statistic in there also. Uh, the number of nodes alongside the uh, cable length is also displayed now. Sometimes that's helpful to have. Still clicking on them will uh, bring up the selection table with the respective neurons that you worked on. Um, right, I talked about the aggregation. There's, uh, you can refresh, but that's obvious. Um, oh yeah, now we'll come to the volume widget to come back to your question. Um, so if you, let's close all that. So for each skeleton or each volume in here, you got this little button or little link, list skeletons in here. And if you click that, it will uh, find all the intersecting neurons with the bounding box of that uh, volume, which potentially is a lot. So if you like request all the neurons for the whole neuropil, that's obviously gonna take a while and probably your browser window will die. Um, so, but just as an example, so let's try that one. And uh, yeah, so it's like 15,000 skeletons loaded. Um, so that's not particularly useful in itself, but might give a good starting point to maybe now reduce this list further by using other filter tools. And in the future, uh, I hope we have a better filter, filter that allows us for one to um, maybe not only use the bounding box, we can do this already on the client, but so far I just haven't implemented it. But it would of, of course be nice to use, uh, have exact intersections with the volume and not only the bounding box, so this will be there at some point in the future. And also, uh, after a quick question in the Slack channel today, uh, was asked uh, about the connectors within a particular volume. It would probably be, make sense to also have a similar button to just list the connectors for the volume in a similar fashion. Um, 
but you can use this list now to filter it further and, uh, and even look only at the individual skeletons that would intersect with uh, the volume based on uh, the regular. Okay. Something needs too much resources on my computer. Let's see, reload. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. A uh, small feature uh, to quickly create volumes around a particular location. Um, let's go back here. Is if you add a new box volume, you get this little button, button here, which just allows you to quickly create a cube around a particular location. Like if a volume for some reason seems to be a particular way, a reasonable way to filter uh, space, uh, you can quickly create volumes, say, by having an edge length of five microns, might be a little bit small, say 10 times the size, and you see it appear here. And if you create it now and give it a proper name, it will be a regular volume and it will be centered around the current location, which is uh, the current location of the stack viewer. And if you display reference lines, you see this actually to be true. And also minor bug, well, I guess I created it too big, but one, uh, I just mentioned it, uh, problem in the past with these uh, overlays was that they were basically ignoring the Z section where you are. Uh, volumes, volume cross sections are now shown properly and uh, disappear when they should, basically. Okay, so, but this is just a quick tool to create volumes quickly. Um, and, okay, so last section about, okay. Um, you mean basically what's done here, like to get the list of skeletons? In the, yeah, yeah, that's done on the back end. So, and there is, uh, let's see, oh, uh, ah. ah, okay, I think it should be skeleton, skeletons by, uh, Bounding box? Yeah, in bounding box. So that's the API you would use for that. It's a skeletons in bounding box, and it requires you to pass in the bounding box corners. Say it again, please. You, you can't just say, like, use this preset narrow fill. You have to enter in the coordinates manually. Uh, f yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess it would actually make sense to just also give it a, allow you to give it a volume ID and just filter by that, that makes sense, yeah. That's just the first uh, version where I thought that I, it's pretty generic, and, but yeah, it makes sense to uh, have this sort of API. So. Okay. Yeah, but like I said, for large volumes, this might still be very slow. And like if you, the bounding box of the mushroom body or so, that's probably, just, the server will probably cut the connection at some point. But uh, you can, of course, just try and see what the limits are. And uh, at some point, we're going to get this fi uh, faster too. And okay. Okay, I'm going to skip the uh, administration uh, aspects. Um, Oh, yeah, maybe that's helpful to know that this API documentation is now also available on cadme.org, so you don't have to look up a particular API, uh, a CADMED instance to see the API API. You have this link here. It looks slightly different, but the, in the end, it's the same thing uh, to find individual API endpoints when you talk uh, to CADMED through the API. Um, yeah, there are small details. Uh, like you can, and labels can now rotate and be, uh, can be rotated in the connectivity widget, which might actually be useful to see and know. So do that. Um, you see the little numbers in here. Um, oh, so if you click this, the headers here change, right? So. And that makes sense for large or larger sets of partner uh, of input neurons to the connectivity widget. 
Um, yeah, I showed this before. The keyboard and mouse help as well. That's the settings widget. Both do how have this filter here, and you can just like type into it, and maybe hopefully quick or find what you're looking for because both widget, widgets grew uh, quite a bit. Um, okay, that's more like a technicality. Uh, you skip over it. Uh, that's mainly important if you have multiple Skag viewers open that you can prevent them all be updated simultaneously, especially like in the connectivity and the connector viewer, for instance, that's a common situation. Having 10 mini stack viewers open, right? And as soon as you move, everything refreshes. <laughs> and this hopefully mitigates that a little bit to cause individuals get uh, stack viewers uh, like in the connectivity, a connector viewer to only update if this update is within its field of view. So that at least minimizes that problem a little bit. Um, another detail, you can now import CSV files directly in the selection tool. And so if you open a CSV, I don't know if I actually have anything here. Let's see. Okay, and if you do that, it will, uh, it doesn't expect a particular format. You can tell it what uh, column and how many rows to skip and so on to be interoperable with all the other, other exports uh, in, in CatMate. So um, let's see. Right, uh, in case you glance at the coordinates down here, and oh, well, I can't do both. <laughs> so if you move the mouse over uh, uh, the stack space or the, the stack viewer, you see the lo uh, mouse locations down here, right? And now both stack and project space are shown. So you know CutMate has this world view of a project space and individual stacks are mapped into that space. And depending on what you want to do, uh, both coordinate spaces might be relevant or could be useful. If you want to talk about your data sets in terms of sections, you look at stack space. But if you define things globally, you define them in project space. And some things like, for instance, uh, the 3D viewer, there is this setting where you can define um, sections that should be uh, interpolated. Of course, we have these weird shifts sometimes, right? And these definitions, for instance, happen in stack and project space. So numbers like here uh, for this interpolation uh, on project space, and one way to get these numbers now are, is down there. OK. Um, well, yeah, I uh, haven't talked about that at all yet. Um, orthogonal views um, have been around in CADMATE since quite a while. And uh, more and more tools can now deal with that and what orthogonal views are, because we currently don't use them really in uh, V14 and also not in L1. Uh, they basically provide you views from, well, the orthogonal perspectives on your data set. And uh, thanks to the work of Andrew Champion, we have now a really good way or quick way to access orthogonal tiles, tile information for uh, all types of image stacks, and we don't need to pre-compile them, um, pre-render them, because this is typically what takes a lot of time and also takes a lot of space. And we just started to make this work for V14 as well, so that's why it's not enabled by default. But maybe you have noticed that you see you have this stacks menu up here. And also, if you, on the front page, there, is, there are more entries now. I don't know if you can see that, actually, uh, down here in the corner. Uh, you have another project, and this, as well as these individual stacks in the regular tracing project, these are only accessible internally currently, uh, because we haven't set up the infrastructure yet to be accessible from other places too, but if you are on the internet, which, uh, well, I'm unfortunately not, uh, let me quickly maybe connect to the, yeah, let me quickly connect to the internet. I, uh, didn't think of, of that because I now can't access it to show it. <laughs> but if you click on it, you won't see anything <laughs> if you're not connected to the uh, uh, internet. Uh, but what it will show in a second, um, um, just a second. I'm gonna enter all my passwords live on the recording. Let's see, hopefully that works. Okay. Mm. 
Okay. Let's see. Okay. So let's. Okay. Let's try opening this first without any tracing data, but this is basically what it does now. And it's on the first section here, that's why it's not showing anything here. But you can see already it's loading uh, on the fly tiles for the orthogonal perspectives. And as you can also see already, it's taking a moment, but it's also over Wi-Fi here, but it's still like pretty fast, in my opinion, for what it does. So, and you can, might be, more useful if we zoom in a little bit more. Oh, I don't have to watch there. And you can see, like, it should line up. So if we select maybe a random location, yeah, it's all looks like in the same spot. And you can navigate in the individual views. And uh, yeah, CADMATE being able to do that in the first place has, place has been around for a while, but uh, we just have never had the data, really, to show that. And the a problem with this currently with respect to tracing is that our tracing access pattern to get the nodes from the back end are pretty much optimized and configured currently to be for X, Y only. And if we load this with regular tracing, uh, it just takes a long time. Um, I think that's only a configuration thing, and I hope I can fix that tonight. Uh, but we can still try and see, and you get these same stacks in your regular tracing project from this menu up here, and you could open, uh, uh, oh, we want to open this in a new viewer, and so this is the XZ view. Oh, okay, but that was stupid of me. I meant to zoom in more, because now it fetches, obviously, the whole, all the neurons that are in the intersection of that orthogonal views, which are going to be a lot, and uh, display them here, so uh, I guess I just reload the page because that's not going to finish within the next few minutes. Um, and let's maybe zoom in a little bit more to maybe give you an idea of how this looks like. Let's see if that's quicker. OK, well, let's let it think about it, but hopefully this will be fast soon too, and you can use the orthogonal views in principle without problems for tracing too. So all the views interact with each other, and you can continue tracing from front view and uh, switch to the next if you think that's a better perspective for that, what you're doing. And uh, now that we have the image data available, uh, we only need to get the tracing for these perspectives fast too, but that's, uh, I think, like I said, only a configuration issue, I hope. Um, okay. So, let's see, last bullet points. Um, yeah, uh, one minor optical change. By default now, uh, we use detailed review colors. They've been around for a while, but uh, at least talking to multiple people showed that this seems to be uh, preferred by more people. Most people to have this more granular 11 color uh, view uh, or review color representation, so that's the default now. And if your colors change, that's why. <laughs> you can, of course, uh, reset this uh, somewhere. Yeah, re use detailed review uh, color status. So you could reset that if you want to. Um, these two bullet points. One of the la a few last points are uh, also about the or deal with this ability to load this tracing data or orthogonal view data on the fly because there is, uh, Andrew wrote, uh, wrote a tile server which is called H2N5. And 5 is a data format uh, that the Southfield lab basically came up with that is what we use to get the image data for generating these orthogonal views on the fly and that's the tile server that uh, does that and CADMATE can now talk to that server, that's basically what that bullet point says. And uh, also, hopefully, uh, noticeable to you too, there are a few uh, performance improvements uh, available for things like review, loading review information for larger connectivity table entries. Uh, should be much faster now because CADMATE keeps track on, of some of the statistics on skeletons on the fly, uh, all the time while continuously, like the node count or cable length 
all this information is now much, much faster available than before. And this information is, of course, needed for review information um, to establish a percentage. So uh, tools needing this information should now be a little bit faster when, require, uh, when acquiring this information. Um, OK, there have been a couple of bug fixes, but I don't go through them individually. But and apart from the API changes uh, that I also won't go over individually, you know where to look if you use the API. Um, that's it. And if you have any questions, comments, and suggestions, let me know. So far, thanks for your attention.